by discussing you know the potential compression problems with the 360 version of Rage last night, um, in a way, were you hoping to influence your fans who then might be able to influence Microsoft by being vocal online and wherever else? Absolutely, <laughs> it would be it would be a good thing if Microsoft did recognize that really the only thing Sony has going for them over the 360 is the data storage on the Blu-ray there. And some of that's obviously the physical difference, but some of it is really a policy question at Microsoft about whether they're gonna choose to gouge the developers this extra cost per DVD, where obviously Microsoft wants a per title royalty. Everybody has to get that the way the console business works on there. But it would be nice if they didn't have to pay a per disc uh, royalty essentially there. And if a developer wanted to make a three DVD or a four DVD title to have competitive data amounts with what you have on the Blu-ray there, that they would only pay the basic media cost rather than an extra licensing fee per disc, which is the way it currently is. Do you think that um, part of Microsoft's you know royalty program has to do with like managing image because since they are competing with Sony and and you know the Blu-ray ability of the PS3 that they do not want to get in the habit of shipping these games with multiple discs that then people can go online and say, look, you have to change your disc and make something of it when perhaps something shouldn't even really be made of it. You know, you and I are used to games where you switch out five you know CD-ROMs and and more at the tail end of that. So it is true that Microsoft did have a pretty strong position about, initially at least, it wasn't even possible to do multi-DVD games. I, you know, ejecting the tray rebooted the thing. And there's they have all that in place now where you can do multi-title games. But there's still commentary like inside the SDK about that are strongly encouraging people to make single DVD titles. And it's true that it is a drawback where flipping DVDs is one of those real intrusive things where uh, playing the game, having fun, get up off your couch, switch to the other DVD. Next time you play it, make sure you switch back to the original one uh, for restarting the game. Uh, it's, like I said, that's the only real advantage that the PS3 has over the 360 from our point of view is the extra space. I might have misinterpreted you last night in your keynote, but it's, it seemed to be that you said that in some ways the hardware for the 360 might even be superior to Sony's outside of, outside of the, the compression issue and the DVDs. Yeah, I mean, that's our position that it's it's almost unequivocal across the board that the 360 is a better platform to develop for. When you get down into actual comparisons on the hardware performance characteristics, it's not quite an apples to apples comparison on almost anything on the strictly graphical side in terms of pushing vertexes and triangles on there. Uh, the 360 hardware is superior to the PS3's RSX on there. And some of that is lineage where the RSX was uh, sort of a PC derived hardware with half of its bandwidth cut off uh, on there, which if you're just pushing a lot of fragments across it, the 360 will be faster in almost all cases. There are certainly contrived cases that you can make where one will work better. If you're doing a not very graphically intensive game, but you want 4X anti-aliasing, but it's vertex heavy and you might be able to get faster on the RSX because you don't have to tile the scene on there to do 4XAA at, at HDTV resolutions. But you have to kind of push hard for it to find cases where the graphics side would ever be any better. On the processing side, it's a little bit more complicated where the main processor on the PS3 is roughly equivalent to one of the three processors on the 360. But then you wind up saying you have to compare two other symmetric processors on the 360 versus the eight quirky cell processors. And that comes down to one of those questions where if you just look at the raw numbers, the cells are much more powerful, much more, many more flops on there. In theory, you can do a lot more, but that's where you come to the difference between theory and practice. And given an infinite amount of development time on there, you can craft a program that's gonna work more efficiently on the cells there than on two additional processors on the, the 360. But given a finite amount of development time, it's much, much easier to get things working well on the 360 than it is on the PS3. And that's pretty much the case across the board. And the other major difference is the memory partitioning, where they're both 512 megabyte machines, but on the PS3, it's partitioned into 256 megs of video, 256 megs of main. And one of the biggest things that Sony does uh, poorly for developers is their system stuff sucks up a lot more resources than it does than Microsoft's does on the 360. So memory is much more painful on the three on the PS3. We spend a lot more time trying to crunch down the memory for that, as well as optimizing up the graphics rasterization performance. Did you receive any emails from either uh, Microsoft or Activision based on last night's keynote? I haven't checked my email since then. Do you expect that you might? Uh, 
I wouldn't think so. I mean, we're, we've broached the subject with Microsoft pretty directly. They know our position on this, and we're trying to say pretty plainly that this is going to be the one thing that this, the PS3 version is going to be better at. And it, in fact, it's almost the worst sort of thing for Microsoft there because we are having to work twice as hard on the PS3 to make it to bring it up to spec, but in the end, it's going to be 60 frames per second game, and it's going to wind up looking just like the 360. We just had to sweat a lot more for it, and if it winds up getting a benefit because of the Blu-ray and having the, the better compression on there, then it's going to wind up looking like the PS3 was the better machine, even though it really wasn't. We had to work a lot harder to get to that point on there, and that'll be that's unfortunate that it'll wind up going out like that. Right. Um, with production budget skyrocketing and whatnot, um, it seemed to be you seem to be saying that you know the the way the games are produced has been changing radically over the years, and yet the way that we plan for the next generation of hardware hasn't been changing in in pace with that. I mean, is that the case? I mean, are you concerned about the next generation of you know of, of consoles and as well as you know PC hardware? My big concern about the next generation on the consoles is that there's this sea change going on to more generalized computational resources where they're still built on top of vertex fragment sorts of processing. And a lot of people kind of miss that point where nobody's designing something just as compute. It's all being designed to be a better GPU than current GPUs, just more flexible in the way that you can do these other things on them. But the big problem is that these are all speculative architectures that nobody really has done a game engine built around these things, and there's a lot of hand-waving going on about how, what we'll be able to do that's going to be so much greater and better in these cases, and it's not a foregone conclusion that any of these other ways of doing things are going to work out competitively with the traditional way of doing things, and at least everybody does have the fallback. If we, the next generation may just be the same thing that we have right now, just four times faster, four times as much memory, and that'll be great. There's not a thing wrong with that. I don't think anyone's going to make a tragic mistake as far as doing something, aiming, making a huge bet towards compute, generalized compute in some way and neglecting the basics on there. I mean, there were certainly the rumors that Sony at least cons almost, made, almost made that tragic mistake on this generation and didn't have a traditional graphics rasterizer in and put in like more cell processors or whatever, and that would have been uh, a deadly mistake. And I don't think anyone's going to kind of fall into that trap of trying to do something radically different without being at least better than what the current status quo is. But the, the cold, hard bottom line truth is that nobody really knows exactly what benefits we're going to be able to deliver to consumers in the next generation of games with these perspective uh, architectures because we don't have them to play with yet and it takes years to go ahead and work out how you want to build a game engine given a new set of technology mm -hmm. so these are big bets that all the players are making there and they're really bets without sufficient data but that's kind of what the business cycle is demanding of them now right. you're concerned about there being certain drawbacks that would come with there being a monoculture you know for as far as development platforms go but at the same time i know uh, you have to be frustrated with elements of you know, making games for so many different platforms. I mean, obviously the case with the compression issue and, and Microsoft is, is one. Um, in the past, you've talked about Sony not necessarily thinking of developers when they're designing their hardware. Um, so how would you, ideally, if you could control it, how would you like to see things shake out and how do you actually, how do you think that they actually will? That, I mean, that winds up being a really tough question because I don't know. I can see both sides of that issue where if we did have a victorious monoculture on there, it would probably be really great for that generation. And it could turn out to be that that winds up being the thing that just kind of stabilizes and goes on with enhancements for a while. And I could imagine that being the best thing, but there's just this nagging back of your mind worry that if you did wind up having the one victor there, does that mean that the pace of advancement you know, really drastically slows down or disappears versus what we've got right now where you have multiple strong players pushing really hard to try and one-up their competitor there. And if somebody was able to go in and sort of clear the field there, there's a lot of barriers to entry now with the, the cost of fabs for the latest stuff going up. There's talk about how there may only be two or three different fabs that are capable of doing these modern chips uh, across the entire world. And you that might be problematic going forward. It might mean that we do stop getting this incredible pace of advancement that we've had here. It would certainly be convenient in the near term for developers to have more of one target for it, but there's more potential for long-term problems. Right. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Um, you also um, discussed the importance of the increasing importance of level designers nowadays. Um, and so I kind of wanted to ask you if you could assemble a dream team and take, you know, does the level design talent from anywhere in the world, you know, who would you take and from where? You know, I'm really not as networked into the industry as a lot of people might think. I, I really do wind up, part of being a good engineer is spending most of my time heads down over the keyboard there, and I don't go to a lot of uh, industry gatherings and so on, so I, I don't have a good survey of who the best designers across the industry are. I mean, certainly when I, I, I bump into the, the old timers, you know, chatting with Will Wright or whoever at, uh, at E3 this year, but I, I, I don't even know who the hot designers are at each of our major competitive companies on there. Mm -hmm. Who's, I mean, do you, do you spend a great deal of time playing the com uh, competitors' games and even, you know, within your own company at Activision and now with EA? So my, the personal games that I play are mostly games that I can play with my little three-year-old, which means Wii and DS games. Uh, that's my daily diet of video games for the most part. Our direct competitors, I wind up looking at in a more clinical way. And that's, there's definitely this aspect to it when you're involved in making the sausage, you really can't appreciate it quite so much. So the games that if I ever look at a, uh, you know, a Gears of War or a Halo 3 or any of those things, I. I can't place myself in the position of enjoying them as much as most of the consumers would be on there. Mm -hmm. And I wind up looking at them with uh, more of a critical eye to say, okay, they're using this technique here and this is what they're doing here. Or I didn't think that was as good as it could be. Uh, so I, I don't get that much kind of fun and enjoyment out of the, the kind of direct competitors for us. On the high-end platforms, I'll enjoy playing things like Ridge Racer or something that's not really directly in line with us because it's something that I can I can allow myself to appreciate more on the game and entertainment side rather than on something that I have to dissect. Right. And this works the same way of course when you're playing games with your children, you know, I'm assuming. So in the same way that Ridge Racer isn't like such a comparable game to Doom or Quake, you're able to play maybe a Boom Blocks or something. So so what kind of um, games are you playing with your children? Uh, we love all the Mario games. We're right now going through Super Paper Mario. We're two levels away from finishing that. We're having a good time with that. We tie it all together with morning is get up, do some flashcards, and get into the video games on there. And that's been, that's actually been working out really, really well. And then we play a lot of DS games, Mario Kart, Super Mario Brothers, things like that. Have you ever considered developing for Nintendo? You know, we actually did do our first product for Nintendo in a long time this last year. We took one of our cell phone titles, Orcs and Elves, and moved it over to the DS. And we didn't have a good success with it. And there's, we knew going into it that it's, it's a tough market to get into where it's amazing how Nintendo has been able to be so successful with the DS and the Wii, but it's not a great market for third parties on there where they make the hardware and then they make all the top games for it. And a lot of that is because they make awesome games. There's just no denying that they have great talent and studios that are, that are doing all of that. But just in general, they haven't been the most, uh, the markets haven't been as open to other uh, third party titles as the PS3 and the 360 and those types of platforms have been. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to say exactly what, you know, what determines all of that, but I, we're, we don't have any current plans slated right now for Wii or DS titles, just because it doesn't fit in well with the titles that we've got, the technology bases that we've got. It's not a perfect fit for anything that we're doing. Have you spoke with um, John Romero in some time? Uh, been a few years since I saw him at uh, maybe an E3 or something, so now I haven't spoken with him recently. Um, I guess the last question I got the notice from, uh, from Andrew. Um, so some of your comments on the future of uh, like a, a big budget Quake Arena style game led me to believe that maybe Quake Wars wasn't as, as successful as you had anticipated? There were a few issues with Quake Wars that the, the multi-platform rollout is an ad object lesson in how not to do things and really does solidify a lot of what we're doing with Rage where the PC version came out and the PC version was good. We really didn't have any, any problems with that. Uh, we had a 360 version, which was also pretty good and was ready not too far after, but the PS3 version was lagging way behind, and they were done by three completely different companies, you know, Splash Damage, Nerve, and Z-Axis, and all sorts of problems were a result of that. And in the end, I, you know, they, we had to hold the, other, hold the 360 version up for the PS3 version because of political vendor stuff on there. You know, Sony doesn't let you release another platform without enhancing the PS3 platform in some way if it comes out afterwards, otherwise they withdraw you know, co-marketing support and stuff like that. 
So we wound up having this skewed launch where the PC version came out and there was a long lag before the console versions came out and we weren't thrilled with uh, how some of the console stuff was in the end. So it was, you know, it was disappointing in a lot of ways, but the project as a whole also was not well envisioned where the original thought on it was it's going to be this multiplayer focused thing take what was everybody loved wolfenstein enemy territory we were going to bring it into the quake world add some uh, some new flashy stuff on it and make a game focused around that type of play but as it went over budget or uh, you know behind schedule all this going on and more money was going into it then the thought had to become well we, it needs to have some single player element to it it needs to have bots and the development time stretches on longer and what should have been a short development time project that was never expected to be a blockbuster. It was expected to be something really catering towards the hardcore fans on here that could have been done in a modest amount of time. It kind of grew and morphed into a project that was larger than its original scope there. And then we had the, the cross-platform nightmare on top of it with all that. So there were a lot of things that didn't go well in that project. Uh, and they're all things that do feed very directly into why we're doing things with Rage the way we are. Hey, thanks so much for your time. Right.